Nobody is taking your testosterone away. Welcome back. We have a very special interview with a very special friend of mine, Rick Collins, lawyer extraordinaire, probably one of the most knowledgeable men in our industry regarding performance enhancing drugs, supplements, and everything else related to that field. And today we're going to be talking about testosterone. Rick, you and I haven't done an interview in quite a while. Uh, I want to welcome you back to the show. Well, thank you. Yeah, I don't know why that was. Uh, we were doing a bunch. Uh, I yeah. remember we once did like a like a three hour interview or something crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we got to do a few more uh, more yeah. often because I miss you, and I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, thank you. Know, you. Um, you just went through thank some some you. interesting thank stuff. So yeah. uh, it's good to have you back and and looking robust. Thanks. You know, um, it seems like we're in the wild west now out here, and the the reason I say that is because. Everywhere you look, there's another hormone replacement clinic popping up and rejuvenation clinic. And there you can go to the mall now and you can get IVs of like different vitamin mixes. And it seems like, um, you know, hormone replacement seems to have been going in the right direction as far as you and I are concerned in the sense mm -hmm. that it was becoming a little bit more acceptable. Um, right. Yeah. And it's, it's very different than the last, probably the last time we talked. It, it, yeah. The landscape has has shifted a lot. Well, you know, my doctor friend who was a, a mentor of mine, Dr. Mike Hoffman back in the in the 90s, always told me that as soon as the congressmen knew that they can get better boners <laughs> taking testosterone, that, that they would all, they would legalize it, you know, so. Right. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, the Chris Bell. Out. Yeah. Yes, yes. Our, our friend Chris Bell, mutual friend, who, who is the uh, guy who did Bigger, Stronger, Faster, he released a video like about a week or two ago, and uh, I responded to it. A lot of people responded to it. Uh, thinking that, you know, Chris had some very, very accurate information. And it was a little disturbing because the information was basically saying that, you know, hey, the government wants to take away your HRT. Uh, you're not going to be able to do telemedicine anymore. You're going to have to see a doctor in person every 30 days. And people are like freaking out because, you know, it, it's so convenient to be able to go to a, uh, you know, one of these rejuvenation clinics like TitanMedicalCenter.com and you, you do a telemedicine visit with the doctor, you go for blood work. And then they, you know, prescribe you testosterone. But you had contacted me and said, you know, Chris was not exactly right about what he said. Can you clarify what this, what, what's going on? Well, well, first, uh, yeah, Chris and I go way back. I remember when Chris first sat in my office before, when, when bigger, stronger, faster was so, just sort of an idea that he had, and and I was grateful that me and John Romano uh, played a role in sort of helping to figure out who should be uh, contacted and who should appear in it. And uh, I love Chris. I loved his family. I loved his mother. Uh, God, you know, God rest her. So um, I, I like Chris very much. Nobody is ever 100% right. If I were to be held to, you know, 100% accuracy or you or anybody else, you know, we all have, have lapses. So you're pretty, uh, Rick, I got to tell you, you're pretty good. You're pretty accurate. I, uh, you. You know, I, 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 I can say maybe I'm not always accurate, but you're pretty accurate when it comes to the law. <laughs> thank, thank you, brother. So, um, so uh, Chris did post something and it was reposted in, in different guises by other social influencers who, you know, you would, you would think maybe did their own research or looked into it. So, so I looked at it and I actually have a copy of, of the, of the particular papers that are in discussion here. And so I wanna kinda of just set the record straight. I, I don't want anybody to get overly alarmed and, and just sort of to give the background. The, the, the nutshell of it is the claim that anybody who's on TRT is going to start to need to, to see their doctor every 30 days in order to refill a testosterone prescription for the rest of their lives is absolutely false. There is nothing in in this rule, this proposed rule, or anywhere else that suggests that, number one. And the other thing is the, the kind of narrative that all of this is about TRT. This is about trying to shut down testosterone clinics or testosterone providers, that that's the focus of what is, is being discussed is also 
absolutely not true. So, okay. so, so that's sort of the nutshell. The, the, the backstory is that uh, earlier last month, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the US DEA, posted on the Federal Register a proposed rule. So that's what we're talking about, a proposed rule, not a rule, it's not in effect yet. It's something that the DEA is proposing and they gave 30 days for people to comment, the public to, to make their own comments about this, this rule. What the rule says, and it's called telemedicine prescribing of controlled substances when the practitioner and the patient have not had a prior in-person medical evaluation. So we're talking about controlled substance prescriptions where the doc, the prescriber, and the patient have never met. Obviously, anybody who's met their practitioner, met their provider, seen right. their doctor, none of this applies. Completely irrelevant. Right. Now, is this, it, it seems like this is more related to something like like pain meds, because I think, that, right? Because, it, or yeah. am I wrong in this? No, no, you, you hit it exactly on, on point. So in 2008, there was this 18-year-old kid who got a hold of Vicodin, went online to a rogue pharmacy clinic kind of operation. He ordered Vicodin. He took the Vicodin. He overdosed. He died. And so Congress wanted to fix this problem of narcotics, which are controlled substances, right. getting out to people who might hurt themselves or who don't need it or who are addicts or you know have, have no medical need for it. And so in 2008, Congress proposed a law that basically says that in order to prescribe a controlled substance, and there's schedules one through five of controlled substances, in order to prescribe it, a practitioner has to see the patient. There has to be an in-person medical evaluation. Does this person need the Vicodin? Does this person need you know, oxycodone or whatever? narcotic or painkiller or opiate is going to be prescribed. Now, that went into effect in 2008. So that required an in-person evaluation by a practice. Right. So that was the law until there was a change in the globe that in 2020 basically made everybody need to, want to, told to stay home. And so that national health emergency suspended the law that, ah. put, that was put into place in 2008. Basically said, look, while we're having this national health emergency, okay, you can get your prescription without having to see your doctor first for as long as this national health emergency lasts. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So... The Biden administration has now declared that the national health emergency will end on May 11th. Okay. So, so the question becomes, well, what, what happens on May 11th? Do we go back to the situation where nobody can get a prescription for an opiate or any other controlled substance without first seeing a doctor? Or do we give some sort of compromise leeway? So the DEA in this proposed rule that I'm talking about basically says, okay, here's what we'll do. You can go online and you can get a prescription for a controlled substance, even if you've never seen the doctor. But within 30 days of that prescription, in order to get more, in order to get refills after that, you've got to see that doctor. Not every 30 days, but that one time within those 30 days. After that, you're good, okay? And so they also said that you don't actually even need to see the doctor who's going to prescribe it. You can say, so if you're in Ohio and you've got a DEA licensed practitioner in Ohio, well, you can get the evaluation from that person. And if you follow certain rules and regulations, yeah. the prescriber, let's say at the clinic in Florida, can prescribe it. Once that's done again, you don't need to keep seeing anybody for, for follow-ups other than what's medically required okay. or what state laws and every state has its own telemedicine laws, its own controlled substance laws. But from a federal perspective, that's it. Further, what the rule says is that if you got your prescription from a online clinic during the national health emergency, right. that you have a 180 day grace period oh. in which to see the doctor. That's great too. So, 
uh, all of that is is very different from what we're seeing kind of put out there. Are there problems? One, one time. You basically have to visit the doctor in per or a doctor in person one time. Right. Right. Okay. That's not bad. Right. I, I mean, it could be. Well, first, it could be inconvenient. There are people who are located very, very far away from where the clinic is. And so there's some, in, you know, inconvenience in, in doing it physically. Um, and the the devil's in the details and everything. Right, Dave? So. The details of you, Rick, back in the day when I was yeah. competing, I would have driven 500 miles to pick up a <laughs> bottle of testosterone that yeah. I knew was real. All right. So yeah. Yeah. I think that for most bodybuilders or even people that are in that HRT stage of their own bodybuilding, no one's going to have a problem traveling once to go see a doctor you or know, getting a cheap flight. I mean, you, you can get yeah. a cheap flight to Florida, yeah. you know, yeah. stay there for one night, do what you got to do. Um, yeah. If you wanted to do it in your own state through your own practitioner, there's a lot of red tape to that. You yeah. and the Ohio doctor would have to be sitting in front of a, you know, a Zoom call with the right. doctor in Florida at the same time. I don't know if there are going to be pain doctors. Neck, yeah. pain it, it, it's a it's a pain. I don't know if the your Ohio doctor is going to be okay with that. So yeah. so there's a lot of issues there. Uh, but the idea that this is all about TRT, this is really about Vicodin. This is about opiates. The only reason testosterone is here is because back in 1990, Congress, back then led by Senator Joe Biden, as then Senator Joe Biden is sort of the, you know, fucking troublemaker. We can't get rid of this guy yet. <laughs> he was the cheerleader and or one of the very strongest cheerleaders to take testosterone and other anabolic steroids and put them into the Controlled Substances Act, even though. As you may remember, and we've talked about this, Dave, yeah. the DEA actually opposed doing yes. that. Then, I love that. Right? The yeah, FDA that, that. opposed it. The American Medical Association, National Institute on Drug Abuse, all sent witnesses to testify to Congress and say, testosterone doesn't belong with these narcotics and opiates and other traditional drugs of addiction and abuse. Congress did it anyway. And so because of what they did in 1990, and then what they did in 2008, now we're in a situation where TRT finds itself kind of being treated in the right. context that was really focused on opiates and narcotics. So as an yeah. expert, Rick, do you ever see a day where testosterone becomes decriminalized and removed from the controlled substance you know, list? Because... I mean, marijuana was. I mean, we right. right? You can you get legal marijuana. Well, right? at the and state levels, but yet not not yet federally, right? Right, right. But federal, testosterone yeah, really too. doesn't. Be, we know that testosterone doesn't really belong there. It's a hormone replacement. Agree. You know, Agree. Kind of thing. These clinics are not writing, bo you know, twenty bottles to the bodybuilders who are using. Them. They're writing it to people who want to take a shot a week so that they have right. natural physiological levels. Right. So plus, plus mean, the you know the, the social harms that are associated with heroin. And, right. and, you know, meth are completely different. Nobody's laying, as we've said before, nobody's laying in an alley somewhere with a needle in their arm with anabolic steroids in it. It's, right. it's, it's not right. happening, right? right. So, so it's again, I understand if they don't want the other anabolics in there because of sports and stuff like that. But why well, that testosterone? Was, that's why testosterone's there. In the right. That's why all of them are there. Was that Ben yeah. Johnson in 1988 won, you know, won, won the Olympics and, and the 100 meters and... <laughs> And then tested positive for Winstrel, right? That's right. that's what this right. whole thing is yeah. about. Uh, <laughs> it's not about TRT. It's not about aging people feeling better or any of that. But but this is this is what happens when you pass laws. So in answer to your question, um, bodybuilders have twenty five years have been asking me, Rick, when when are we going to be able to get this changed? When is Congress going to realize? When is somebody in Washington yeah. going to think? that maybe testosterone is is unfairly treating people because of its controlled substance status. And the, the answer to that is strange bedfellows, right? Um, the, the only glimmer of hope for that actually happening is coming from the action of the trans community, from the trans community of the LGBT community, yeah. which um, is pushing for a either descheduling or lowered scheduling of testosterone specifically because of the stigma and the inconvenience and the, all of the problems of, of these higher restrictions on people who were assigned female at birth 
and are seeking to either change their gender to male or to simply move somewhere along a spectrum toward a more masculine phenotype right. that that those people are being unfairly treated. And two right. U.S. senators have written a letter to the Biden administration fairly recently saying that, you know, based on the the improper, you know, prejudicial impact on people who are assigned female at birth seeking to transition in the trans community, that testosterone should be taken out of the Controlled Substances Act entirely, or it should be descheduled, lowered in its scheduling to, to a Schedule 5 or something like that, which if it ever were to happen, and it were done at that sort of, from that broad perspective, right. well, then certainly anybody who's hypogonadal, you know, men who are, who are on TRT, would be, you know, would be happy, right? Because you, you yeah. have potentially a, a, a sea change in the accessibility. Um, but, but that, just like this rule that's not yet happened, uh, I don't know how likely that'll be to, ha to happen. You know, Congress isn't, you know, playing nice so much these days. So uh, what will happen, I don't know. But that's the glimmer of hope. Well, I figured it this way. If I just say that, you know, wake up tomorrow and I say, you know what? Today I really, I really feel like a woman. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I want to turn back into a man. So I need testosterone. They can't really deny me, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I always suspected you were going there, you know, but... Um... But, uh, well, you know, they, they really, they're not denying, you know, nothing in this rule is denying anybody testosterone, you know? This no, but is what just... I'm saying is you think it'll be more easily prescribed by doctors now that it's like, you know, you can kind of pick your own gender every day you wake up if you want to change your mind, you know, you, it's like, yeah. uh, it's acceptable now to do that, you know? I think whenever the government gets involved in making something controlled, you you develop a black market for it. And, and I've even heard that, that there's even a sort of a, a black market in the trans community for right. testosterone. So, so whenever the, the, the government gets involved, and, and we've talked about this before, you know, when testosterone became a controlled substance, that, that certainly didn't get steroids out of sports since yeah. 1990. I think we can agree yeah. on that. It yeah. didn't keep it out of the hands of teenagers. Um, you know, it, it didn't kind of diminish the black market. It actually right. exploded the black market. Yep. Because when you when you don't have legitimate sources of supply for something, but you still have demand, basic economic principles will say, guess what? The black market balloons, right? Yep. Yep. It, it's kind of sad when you think about it that, 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 you know, look, whether I think that, you know, someone should transition or whatever or not, this, it's, that's not my business because everyone makes their own decisions. But of course. if you decide that you're, you were, you know, if you were born a biological female and you decide you want to be a male, you should have the option to use testosterone. And so, um, I don't, you know, it's, you and, and you do, them. you know, there, there are, you know, certainly you do. And, and those prescriptions do take place, but controlled substance status puts a layer of stigma and right. restriction and some doctors right. look at it differently but those same arguments you know on perhaps at a, at a at some other level but certainly some of those same arguments could be made for the the 60 70 year old guy who isn't feeling good whose levels are down low maybe they're not a hundred but maybe they're 350 or some and he feels right. terrible um, yep. But but there are some endocrinologists who will say, well, you're within normal limits, so you know, no no testosterone for you, like no soup for you. And I think most doctors are, to be honest with you, general practitioners are are really afraid to prescribe testosterone. They don't want to be scrutinized by the DEA. They don't want to be scrutinized by their colleagues, and so they just don't give it. And so that's why these hormone replacement clinics are so are booming because right. people don't want to, they don't care. People will pay cash for the stuff. They don't want to deal with their doctors and having to like, try to like sway their doctor into prescribing some stuff. So they just go to the hormone replacement clinic. So if, imagine yeah. if all doctors could just prescribe this stuff to their patients without any stigma, without right. any paperwork. I think and, and with some of level of knowledge, because most doctors, right. I mean, let's face it, even most endocrinologists, I don't know if you've found this, but I've found most endocrinologists that I speak to are familiar, very familiar with thyroid prescribing yeah. and with, Insulin. Um, yeah, Insulin. and with um, female, you know, estrogen prescribing, estrogen. but, but testosterone, not, not as much. 
They know nothing about it. I have friends who are endocrinologists. They know nothing about it. Right, right. Yeah, which is scary. And that's why these clinics play an important role. Yep, yep. You know, all you have to do is, is add a course to the, <laughs> to the curriculum at medical school about anabolics or about testosterone, and that would solve the problem. They, they don't even, you know, when I went to medical school back in the 90s, they don't even teach you about that. So how would you know about it if, unless you were a bodybuilder? You know, if you weren't, you wouldn't even know if you I, I remember one time I was just messing around. I asked a, a doctor in the hospital. I said, what do you think about steroids? And he's like, prednisone. He didn't even, <laughs> right. he, didn't, he didn't even like like right. steroids to them are, are, are corticosteroids. Right. They don't even think in that other direction because right. they have never been trained in that direction. I took pharmacology. They never mentioned it in pharmacology, how it works, you know, you know why you'd use it. Now, I don't know. Maybe the curriculum has been updated since then, but I. I, I, I have this sneaking suspicion it probably hasn't. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it has. And I've spoken to some younger doctors and it doesn't seem like, you know, mo it seems like most of their information really comes from, you know, what they read in the news, you know, yeah. which which yeah. is, I, I think we could all agree, not not as reliable as we'd like it no. to be. No, it's funny, I, um, I had created a, um, a, a pregnancy protocol, like how to, you know, become more fertile. Because um, when I was trying to have my kids, you know, I, I did a lot of research and I, you know, I put together this whole protocol of HCG, HMG, Clomid, you know, gl glutathione, which happens to be a good sperm motility, you know, drug uh, supplement. And I, I put this whole protocol together. I give it out for free to everyone. And I'm probably responsible for, for make, for more people having babies than, than the fertility doctors yeah. in the entire Dave Palumbo's world repopulation yes. program. That's yeah. right. Now, the funny thing was one of the people that I gave it to was going to a fertility clinic and spending like $35,000 they had spent already and they and they had no luck. And all of a sudden they were so desperate that the wife reached out to me, I gave her the protocol. I said, look, just follow this. They got pregnant in like a month and a half or something like that. And they showed it. And they, when they went back to the fertility clinic, the doctor's like, what a miracle. He goes, all of a sudden, what, what, you know, I, all of a sudden I, I didn't think you, I thought we were gonna have to do something else, you know, do IVF or whatever. What yeah. would you do? And some other very him, expensive procedure, right? She showed him the protocol that I gave him, and he's like, "This is pretty good." <laughs> like he didn't foo foo it. He was like, "This is good. This is good." Maybe I just because they uh, the problem is that like Pergonol. We better is protect that intellectual property. Yes, yeah. Well, you know what it is. It's and they so should have expensive. named that baby after you, Dave. Yeah. They should name that baby Dave, right. male That's or right. female, or, or any, whatever. Yeah, or whatever they decide to be. Yeah. That's the funny right. thing is, though, it's so expensive because, you know, they overcharge for these fertility drugs because they're orphan drugs that no one wants to prescribe enough of it because it's just too goddamn expensive and the insurance companies won't cover it. So yeah. they underprescribe it. It doesn't work as well as it should. And then they don't get the results. So it, it goes back to what we were just saying. The stigma of a lot of these these right. these drugs are such. And the fact that the government allows these drug companies to overcharge for these things because because only a very small population of people use them is right. destroying this country. Obviously, you know, it's right. I mean, right. look what happened right. with insulin. Thank God for Walmart and Walmart decided, you know what, we're going to make insulin readily available. We don't want to see people dying of, of, of not being able to take insulin, you know? Right. Right. So, but well, Rick, as always, I love to get you on because I always get awesome. the, the right perspective and the, uh, the, the interpretation that is uh, usually the correct one. When do you think this law is going to go into effect if it does? Well, it, again, it would just be an administrative rule. It would, it mm. would, you know, amend the way that the the law that Congress passed is, is being, you know, implemented. Um, right. You know, I, I don't think anything moves that quickly. I know that a lot of people do, have told me that they've written to the DEA, and so the DEA has to kind of look at all those comments. Um, typically, when FDA has done this. It's been quite a long time until yeah. there's some activity. So I don't think this is necessarily imminent. It's not like it's going to pass. You know, my sense is it's not going right. to. It's not gonna suddenly uh, go into effect in you know a month or two. That that's not happening. Well, Rick, thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you got a lot going on, and uh, it was great catching up with you. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. Feel good, brother. All right. Thanks, Rick.